Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we have a wonderful guest that will be joining us for the second time, Don Kalshad. He's going to be talking about inner and outer democracy and the threat of authoritarianism, which are his reflections on the psychological factors at play in this polarized world. You can learn more about these ideas in a book called Cultural Complexes and the Soul of America. Don has a more fulsome essay on this called Wrestling with Angels, and he's also put this forward in a wonderful webinar, and you can find that at aras.org slash WJ webinars, and we'll have those links in the show notes. So for those of you that may just be meeting Don for the first time, we know Don uh, through <laughs> our wonderful training process. Uh, Don has been a, an extraordinary supporter and contributor and just the the leprechaun of our hearts and <laughs> <laughs> the training. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about um, Don. He was born in Wisconsin and went to the University of Wisconsin and got his first degree in philosophy. He went to Union Theological Seminary in New York, where he got his M. Div degree with a specialty in psychology and religion, which, of course, all of those things set him up beautifully to become a Jungian analyst. He was a clinical psychologist, or earned that degree at Fordham University, and his PhD studies were done at the C.G. Jung Institute of New York with a specialty in narcissism and its treatment. He's been the head of various institutions. He's facilitated trainings both for psychoanalysts and Jungian analysts. And Don has made a substantial contribution to the way that Jungians conceptualize trauma, how the archetypal dynamics that we all are so interested in as Jungians play a central role in how we survive trauma and what we then need to overcome as a result mm -hmm. of that. And so we are could not be more thrilled to share an hour or so with Don talking about this next topic, which is so important to all of us. So, Don, hello. Hello. Good to be and, here. And uh, I just want to say, too, that when we were in training, Don ran a uh, case control colloquium. That was uh, the, the prize. If you could get into Don's control <laughs> colloquium, you were counted among the fortunate. I was not that fortunate, but um, uh, he he's, was so popular always among the trainees. I'm sure that's still true. So we're, we're delighted to have you. And before we launch into the topic, I just want to remind everyone about our um, Patreon. You can become a patron and support us for a small amount of money each month. And we make little mini episodes every week for you to enjoy. For example, this week, we're going to be talking about a question submitted by a patron about ways to uh, psychologically heal outside of therapy. Therapy is expensive. It's not available to everyone. So what are some other ways that we can grow into wholeness? So we'll be talking about that in our special episode. Okay. So, Don, 
where can we put uh, a first footstep in this yeah. topic? Well, let me uh, start us out by just some general reflections, maybe. Um, uh, obviously, my interest in this question of inner and outer democracy and the threats of, of polarization has been stimulated by the political situation in our country and in the world, really, um, since probably the early part of of this decade, 2012, 13, 14, and certainly 2016 with the election of Donald Trump. Uh, we've seen an increasing extremification and increasing polarization, uh, an, ex uh, an increasing what David Brooks calls mean world, mm. um, you know, antagonism, uh, denigration of the other, lack of civility, breakdown in, um, in those institutions that support our communication with each other and an increasing reversion really to um, to simplifications, oversimplifications. Um, you know, the, the, the problems of our time in the world and in the nation are extremely complex. And, um, and yet our political discourse reduces these very complex and difficult nuanced problems yeah to uh, a bumper sticker or to a, a Twitter feed. Um, and so we're, we're, this is the dumbing down really of our conversation. And of course, social media has a lot to do with this because um, we can all hide or find refuge in our silos of like-minded people. And we can be liked for our opinions and for our outrageous videos and our selfies and all the rest of it. So we're in a world right now where uh, the old style, you know, democratic processes of debate and, and uh, conversation are increasingly rare and, and um, on the collective level. And um, the reason I got particularly interested in this is that back in the eighties, I, was working with a number of people who um, had an early trauma history. Now, by that, I mean uh, a history of, of early violation of the integrity of the child, either through emotional neglect or uh, emotional abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse. And these injuries and invasions occurred before, say, they were even age three, four, uh, in very early childhood. And the result of that, of those, uh, traumatic experiences, which I began to uncover in the history of, of some of my patients, much to my surprise, because back in the eighties, we didn't really have an understanding of how pervasive early trauma was or how exquisitely sensitive the personality is to the, the violation of, of the integrity of the person. Um, robbing of innocence, the, the destruction of, of the human personality, really. As I began to work with these individuals and at, like a good Jungian looking into their dreams, um, because that's something we do as Jungian analysts, as you know, um, I began to discover a lot of violence. Uh, I was shocked at the amount of violence that I was discovering in the dreams of these patients. Some of them would tell me, I, I can't come into therapy with you. I, I can't talk about my dreams. They're, they're all persecutory. Uh, they're nightmares. I, I can't even go to sleep anymore. And so, and the other thing I discovered is that, um, that a lot of the violence that was coming up in the dreams, um, was directed either at the, at the dream ego, at the, at the person of the patient or at some young, child or uh, or even um or even an innocent animal so it was as if uh, violence was attacking vulnerability and yeah. uh this was astounding to me because nothing in my jungian training prepared me for uh quite for the amount of aggression in these dreams directed back at the vulnerable core of the personality um uh and and the the sort of stupefaction and and um, 
uh, dissociated state that that people ended up in after these dreams. Um, I remember one very, very vivid one where um, I'd had a very moving session with a patient. Um, she had discovered a film of her two-year-old self buried in her mother's basement. She was busy cleaning out the house, and there she found these old VCRs hmm. of a wedding that her father had taken pictures of the wedding, and she was there uh, as her two-year-old self, running around trying desperately to get people's attention, you know, grabbing the legs of people standing around at this cocktail party. And nobody would would even notice her or pay any attention to her until she was reduced to falling in the dusty ground and pounding her little fists, wailing and crying. And the, the father continued to take this picture. Right. And she had seen this and she was in tears as she presented it. And it was unusual for this very uptight, a uh, very proper and somewhat depressed woman to feel feelings like this. So I said, well, why don't you bring the movie in and we'll watch it together? And she did, and we watched it together. And I was terribly upset seeing this scene, and she noticed tears in my eyes. And more than the scene and the sharing of the scene was the moment between us when she actually saw that I was moved by this picture. This meant more to her than I was uh, aware that it would mean to her. Uh, it was a very spontaneous moment. Anyway, she went home. She wrote in her journal. She stayed up late into the night, deeply moved, wrote poetry to me, to us, <laughs> said in her journal, you affected him. You affected him. He cares about you. Now, you know, I thought this was all understood in my relationship with this woman, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So she was very moved. She said, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Then she went to bed and she had the following dream. Two women, sisters, long since separated, are about to be reunited in a joyful reunion scene. And she is watching this reunion scene from outside the action and the action takes place in an old mansion like the one with gone with the wind is my association mm -hmm. with those huge balustrades that come up to a balcony mm -hmm. uh, and the one sister is approaching from be below dressed in green the other sister is waiting anxiously and excitedly on the balcony dressed in red and as the sister who is coming up to join her long lost sister uh, uh, ascends the stairwell. A curtain parts, and a man in black with a shotgun blows her away. Oh boy. And she falls, dying and bleeding, down the stairs. And the woman up, up above is shocked, and the dreamer is shocked. And there is this scene of death and destruction right after this tremendous longing for a reunion. And my patient said, I must be crazy. Who has dreams like this? And I said to her, because I was getting the message by then, people with early trauma have dreams like this. And then I explained to her what has become, what I've become aware of is that there is an authoritarian, tyrannical, fascistic system in the human psyche, especially in the psyche of people who have suffered so much early devastation that they've needed these very powerful, aggressive, dissociative defenses to save them. And these dissociative defenses come in to kill the connections with vulnerable feeling and also with creativity and self-expression because they mistake such feelings of vulnerability and self-expression as new additions of what led to the trauma in the first place. And they will not allow the host personality of the patient to experience these very vulnerable opening 
uh, experienced before because they have a memory of how devastating the abuse was that occurred when the child was very young. So, in other words, I became acquainted with authoritarianism in the inner world. And so I got very interested in how this played out in the lives of my traumatized patients. Um, and I, I, I came to adopt a, an image which many of you have seen me use. Um, I don't have it here right now, but it's, it's, it's an image from Will, William Blake. Um, <clears throat> it's an illustration mm -hmm. hangs in the Tate Gallery and it contains mm -hmm. two angels, one dark and one light. And the image is called the light and dark angel, the good and evil angels fight for possession of a child. And there's a child in the image fleeing from the dark angel into the arms of the bright angel. And the dark angel is, is shackled to the flames of hell and he's represented as Lucifer in Hades. And the bright angel is up on a cloud and she's associated more with the, the, uh, spirit world with, um, with compassion and with, uh, love and containment. So I came to realize that both those angels are part of a defensive system uh, that comes in, in to protect the person from early trauma. And I call this system the self-care system. So as I understand the self-care system, it contains very powerful archetypal defenses. And the two powers that it seems to use in order to dissociate the psyche of the young child are violence on the one hand and illusion on the other. The bright angel I see as, as illusion, necessary illusion. It's up to the bright angel to maintain hope in the presence of devastating realities that the child can't, can't bear. My favorite story about the bright angel is a story that comes to me from my old analyst, Edward Edinger, about about this little girl who was told by her mother to take a message to her father who was reading in the study. And the little girl trotted off with the message and returned a couple minutes later and said, Mommy, the angel won't let me go in. And the mother knew that her daughter was very imaginative at this point. And so she said, well, now you just tell the angel that you have to deliver this message to your daddy. And the little girl went off again, came back two minutes later, more tears, Mommy. Mommy, the angel won't let me go in. So the mother took her daughter by the hand and she said, well, what's going on over there? And so she walked with her daughter over to the threshold of her husband's study. She looked through the door. There was her beloved husband dead in his chair from a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. Mommy, the angel won't let me go in. Mm -hmm. Now that's the bright angel. It's up to the bright angel to create life-sustaining illusions, alternative realities that provide the child with hope and a symbolic story that's possible to live in and survive in while reality is getting itself together. Hopefully this mother didn't disappear into her own hysteria but was able to show up for the child. But you get the point. So the two angels represent violence on the one hand that attacks the links with painful experience and illusion on the other that creates alternative realities within which hope can be sustained. Now, the bright angel is an expert at conspiracy theories because conspiracy theories are illusions that sustain people when they can't face realities. Violence is the angel that um, that attacks the lynx. Both angels are experts at dissociating the child from the realities mm -hmm. of its painful feelings that it can't bear. Now I should say this system is not in place in all people that I work with. Um, in, in a more a healthy individual who hasn't suffered so much trauma, the, the dark angel will be simply healthy aggression. And the bright angel will be uh, compassion and realistic hope. 
-hmm. But when you need those defenses in early life, these um, these angels take the form of violence on the one hand and illusion on the other, which is which are archetypal binaries. They're extremes, and that's why they're archetypal defenses. So the role of violence in American culture today and the role of illusion, uh, disinformation, uh, what Alex Jones calls false flag in, uh, operations like in Sandy Hook, it didn't really happen. It's all just an illusion. So you can see what I mean when I say that these defenses and these powerful archetypal forces uh, have taken over a great deal of our public discourse. Um, mm -hmm. And the psyche, the archetypal psyche, is plastered all over our politics right now. Yeah. And it's terrifying because, mm -hmm. because authoritarian personalities, uh, Theodore Adorno wrote a book called The Authoritarian Personality back in the 1950s. And what he discovered is that authoritarianism uh, the extremes, violence and illusion, are, uh, are, are features of a personality disorder, really, on both the left and the right, politically. Mm -hmm. Right now, we see it a lot more in American culture on the, on the radical right. Uh, but it's also on the left, in the hyper-progressive, um, uh, you know, the cancel culture that goes on in, in American universities, um, the so-called safe zones that are necessary uh, for, God forbid, for people that would be traumatized by use of the wrong words. Uh, we're, we live in a culture right now where, where we're, you know, the democratic middle, where we actually can have conversations about ideas and where feelings can be exchanged and opinions can be exchanged is uh, has been taken over by, mm -hmm. uh, by the extremes. You know, it used to be before, I think it was Bill Clinton's administration, there was a thing called the Fairness Doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where the news had to be reported uh, in a standardized form. And we had, I, some of you are old enough to remember this, we had Walter <laughs> Cronkite on CBS. Uh, and then we had ABC and NBC forget the the people but we all got our news from a standard source and they weren't identical there were different opinions but when the fairness doctrine was canceled there was a vacuum created that talk radio filled and rush limbaugh on the right and i don't know who on the left rushed in to fill that vacuum and so instead of news we we got opinion and mm -hmm. Then when social media flooded and, and, the, and the World Wide Web flooded us, we got more opinion. And now, um, I'll tell you a little moment when I was in Santa Fe, uh, we lived in Santa Fe until about three years ago. We now live in Maine. Uh, I was on a walk down in an arroyo in, uh, in town and I was looking up at some beautiful stellar jays, uh, a, a deep azure blue bird that comes down out of the higher elevation sometimes into Santa Fe. And I was looking up and seeing this bird and this lovely young, young old couple uh, with a dog came walking down the arroyo and they said, ah, looking at them chemtrails, are you? Hmm. And I said, what? <laughs> And they said, yeah, them chemtrails. And I, I said, you mean the, the, the jet contrails in the sky? And they said, oh, yeah, but those are chemtrails. Uh, that's the government um, trying to infect our atmosphere. You know, those clouds oh. that be up there, they're not real just clouds. They're, those, those are chemtrails. You can Google it if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were getting their news through the web. Yeah. And I did Google it, and I went down a rabbit hole that was quite unbelievable. Yep. Uh, and so this is the conspiratorial thinking about how our innocence mm -hmm. is being robbed by forces beyond our control. And if we can gin up, if the bright angel can gin up enough outrage at the violation of our innocence, 
it, it feeds into the to the violent angel on the left. So, mm-hmm. um, so, mm-hmm. so you know, the two work in tandem. Bright angel and the dark angel work in tandem to create uh, the uh, the kind of authoritarian culture of mm-hmm. extremes that we're living in right now. So that's an uh, introduction to these ideas. Uh, what um, you know, what I'm picking up on is the difference between someone with with early trauma, uh, where the bright and the dark angel are you know truly emanations from the unconscious, and uh, somebody like Alex Jones, uh, who knows better, uh, his denial of uh, the the awful shooting at Sandy Hook, um, it is out and out conscious intended mm-hmm. manipulation, and I'm curious about where where that comes from because he's not the only one. There are plenty of people. You know, out there in the public arena, mm-hmm. who, who are manipulating people for their own, you know, f- to get reelected or elected in the first place, or can keep their uh, online or uh, other kind of audience, or to make money, but to make money, et cetera, and and know very well that that's what they're doing. Well, that's exactly. a different dynamic. It's a different dynamic, Devin. That's a good point that you make because um, the there are people who know better, and they are likely mm-hmm. uh, people who are not completely identified with the archetypal powers, yes, uh, which flow through them. Which is more the case of uh, of early trauma victims, and you know, I think. Um, People who are walking around in this culture are, are by and large mostly sane enough to know that the extremes uh, are not literally true, you know. But uh, as you point out, there's great gain to be to be mm-hmm. made, great self-esteem to be yeah. had. And the other thing that that drives a lot of this, I think, is fear. You have to remember. Yeah. Trauma is a fear psychology, and the defenses that come to the aid of the trauma victim, violence and illusion, these extreme forms of dissociation, are really based on fear at the core. Um, and not only fear at the core, but um, if you can generate enough hatred, you immediately cohere the psyche from its fragmentation mm-hmm. and its uh, and you know exactly who you are. And if you can also gin up a story about uh, the extreme situations and how we're all being done to and violated by, yeah. by big bad uh, government or big bad pharma or big bad uh, media or God knows what else, <laughs> uh, then you get self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you can see a little silo of people who believe as you do, uh, you much prefer to stoke self-esteem uh, mm-hmm. in those silos than to struggle. Well, there's one more quote I'll give you. Simone Weil said, the false god transforms, uh, let's see if I can get this right now. Uh, Suffering into violence. Yes, yeah, transforms. The true god yeah, transforms, transforms violence suffering into suffering. Into violence. The false god transforms suffering into violence. The true God transforms violence into suffering. Hmm. Now, we, we serve democratic forms of governance and democratic forms of polity, whether it's inwardly or outwardly, serve the true God because it's a matter of transforming violence into suffering. That's what democracy does in its best, at its best. Hmm. Believe me, uh, democracy... Uh, has all the authoritarian features in it that um, authoritarianism does. It, it is a constant struggle between the extremes, but when it's working, the extremes have a forum and a yeah. place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Inside the psyche, yeah. that's called an ego, an observing <laughs> ego, yeah. that can hold conflicting affects, love and hate. And um, those of us who work in this field have had 
to understand that when we're working with a borderline personality or somebody with a lot of early trauma, we are likely to uh, have to develop some emotional literacy and resilience to handle the love and hate that we're going to feel in our counter transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the inner world of the patient uh, split between extremes is going to find its way into the relationship with us. And then there's a, a huge danger and a huge opportunity <laughs> called democracy of the psyche. We have a chance to transform archetypal affects, extremes, into human stories, mm -hmm. human suffering. Well, and it's almost like the culture right now has borderline personality disorder. Yeah. <sighs> And oh. it's, it's not, it's not just happening among people who have, uh, early trauma histories, but it's almost yeah. like our institutions are behaving like someone in that position. That's right. And, and, um, Don, I, I just, I love this thesis and I, I feel like I have to chew on it, um, yeah. to really wrap my head around it. But I'm, I, I love what you said. I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, the, the paper that you delivered for the Ukrainian webinar. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, um, you know, in a, in a sort of uh, healthy psyche, different, I'm quoting here from your paper, different mm -hmm. eye positions can be held in tension without threatening the integrity of the person. And of course, we always talk all the time about holding the tension of the opposites. You know, right. that's, an, that's an inner job. And yep. you say, this is what Jung meant by a democracy of the psyche Another word for it is a conflict psychology, which I guess yes. is Bromberg. Yeah. And I, yeah. I love that. I love that conflict psychology. And you say authoritarianism cannot tolerate inner conflict, so it displaces one pole of the conflict into the world, which of course is projection. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, these borderline dynamics of splitting and projecting, which exactly. which we clinicians know very well. And this idea of conflict psychology, you know, I'm thinking about just the person that comes in with uh, the kinds of concerns that bring people into analysis. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's, uh, you know, a question of a career change or just a vague sense of malaise or, you know, an unhappiness in a relationship. And really what we do is create a field or a container where conflict can be tolerated, where the inner conflict can be held and right. we we can tell when someone's splitting off that at that uh, conflict and resting into certainty. I'm reminded of one of my favorite young quotes that fanaticism is always a sign of a repressed doubt. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And That's... what we want to do in the analytic container is make room for that ambivalence, give the ambivalence back to the person, tolerate the ambivalence. And and we like to say that if you can do that, then the third thing arises and we're in the, the field of the transcendent function. That's right. But in the culture now, I mean, you, you know, so we've all had people come in who cannot tolerate the other side of their conflict. That's and, right. And uh, they, they, you know, that can look different, differently. I mean, I have, I have people that come in and will sort of apologize, apologize for... Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, someone who maybe comes in with uh, terrible, unacceptable feelings, let's say, of resentment toward a sibling. Mm -hmm. And that feels so uh, forbidden that I can tell it's there, it's showing up in the dreams, but I, I know that I have to be very careful with it because I can tell that it's very forbidden. And when it comes up, you know, the person says, you know, well, I know that I, I know that sounds terrible to say, and there's kind of, it's uh -huh. wrapped in all these uh, um, layers of sort of apology and hedging and, you know, and, and, and part of what I think my job is to gently give the person permission to have the full range of experiences and reactions so that we, again, have both sides of the conflict in the room. And this is happening on an outer level where, you know, there, there is this sense that there's all kinds of things we can't say. There's all kinds of things we can't say in the culture. And we we can't have a sort of dialogue about things because we we risk offending right. someone or we've been told that you know language is literal violence uh but we need to be able to have these conflicts that is exactly you're exactly right that that is essential to democracy so Absolutely. i just I, I love these ideas 
Well, thank you. Um, let me just tag on to that a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Philip Bromberg, who is deceased now, he died a few years back, but he wrote several books. One was called, the, his first book, which was a collection of his essays called Standing in the Spaces. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by the spaces are the spaces created by dissociation, mm -hmm. the different parts of the self, what he called self states that exist because um, getting those discrete dissociated self states together in an ego is too painful. Right? I mean, your point is certain people can't really entertain the conflict that's inside them yet. Mm -hmm. Right? Some of my people with early trauma histories have conflicts that they don't even know about yet. In that's other words, right. mm -hmm. Yes, they, they will have uh, been yeah. violated by a father before their memory. And the the remnants, the implicit memory of that is in the psyche someplace as a terrifying moment associated to various features of the father. But all they have is flashbacks of something that happened. I know something happened to me, but I don't know what it was. So as the process begins and as dreams unfold and so forth, slowly those scraps of, of unremembered trauma uh, come up and then they are in terrible conflict. And some of that conflict is grief, hmm. right? I mean, the, a sure sign of conflict, conscious conflict is grief because uh, we, we have experienced feelings that are so painful that it's hard for us to go there. And we have to grieve the innocent parts of ourselves that want that never to have been the case. And yet it was the case. And we also have to love the people that violated us mm -hmm. or, or find our way eventually to, to as much love as we can to entertain both love and hate, which is always, uh, the opposite mm. that, that Jung most talked about. He didn't actually talk about them, but that's, those are the ones he meant. Mm. Um, so yeah, so dissociative psychology versus conflict psychology. Yeah. Dissociative psychology is authoritarianism. And, uh, and, conflict and psychology is democracy. Right. And, <laughs> and the grief that you're talking about, that's the depressive position. That's the depressive position. Be. Melanie Klein said, the biggest accomplishment of the child is to love and hate the same parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was, that was for her, the, the mm -hmm. sine qua non of emotional That's development cool. for a child to be able to really feel the love and the hate and have it okay and be able to fight with the person you loved and come out of it <laughs> more whole and, and more integrated. And yeah. the connection, and then we're not yeah. defending against unacceptable feelings and and so, uh, attitudes yeah. and thoughts. Yeah. Yes. Now I have one other uh. thought, and I'm going to let you guys talk. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the current situation in America and in the world, uh, I think the reason that I'm finding a connection between this structure I call the self-care system with its violent and and possessively loving sentimental angels. I think the reason I'm finding that uh, so applicable to the outer situation is that I think we are in a trauma vortex right now mm -hmm. in the world and in the culture. And I think one of the reasons we are is that we are being asked to experience things that we can't fully let in. We can't mm. fully mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Like the fact that we are burning up our own world. Yep. Like the fact that violence is so out of control in so many places that we are so helpless in the face of big capitalistic systems, mm -hmm. big governmental systems, big corporate systems that we don't have any real capacity to affect other than to complain and and hopefully to demonstrate. So I think if I'm not mistaken, one of the reasons that violence is being resorted to and that so much 
disinformation and fake news is proliferating through our airways right now, which are signs of the, of the light and dark angel, is because we as a people on this planet are having a lot of trouble facing reality. Mm-hmm. We have a national or an international reality disorder. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the things that I think we do in our consulting rooms is to uh, sort of reframe uh, the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody comes in who's having difficulty with, you know, career or relationship, and we broaden it out and get to restate it so that the person can rename it and know that as existing in him or herself. Right. And I'm wondering if that's part of what we're doing this morning, that you're doing, Don, is that what if we reframe and rephrase this problem, which is we're in a, we're in a really difficult and sad state in the world mm-hmm. of to to grieve what is happening, for example, with with climate, rather than splitting it off and making some people bad or wrong, which would be, I think, the dark angel. That's right. And then other people, you know, the bright angel is, oh, the earth goes through all these cycles anyway, and it has for millennia, uh, so it's not a big deal, and... Uh, people need fossil fuels and so on and so forth. But, the, you know, if we could let it in, in other words, mm-hmm. if we could as a collective develop a conflict psychology. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And and what we have to keep in mind is even in the face of all this uh, devastation on the planet and uh, in our country, um, we are also up against the exquisite and unbearable beauty of the world. <laughs> and, yeah. and so we have this, mm. this conflict within us, you know, the, the ache of our love for this world and the people that we're close to in it, and also the grief of having to face uh, all of the dark side of, uh, of this. And so the human condition, if we're going to really embrace it, um, you know, if we really want to develop some emotional literacy and some affect tolerance, some affect capacity, mm-hmm. then we really have to work hard to hold these opposites inside ourselves and to not lose faith or hope that if we do that, you know, we don't know the future. A third will manifest. Consciousness will occur. It's we don't know the future and uh, and that's so the naysayers and the assayers we have to hold them both uh, mm. and 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 live through the process you know embrace the process don i i'd like to ask you to unpack um some of the various stages that you were talking about for the listeners so that we can kind of track a little bit, um, a little more meticulously. So there was a, a wonderful sequence that I think is so helpful to understand. So this is a psychology of fear, right. overwhelming fear, fear okay. at the point where we, we don't know what to do um, in a different situation or with a stronger psychology, someone would be able to perhaps regulate the fear. But in an individual, this fear is now created an unbearable state. And then the bright angel gins up enough fantasy of the violation of our innocence that it justifies launching into a kind of hate and violence Mm -hmm. to cohere the psyche. Right. So let's, let's lean into that first part. What makes fear intolerable for one person and perhaps 
tolerable or workable for another person. How, how is it that that particular piece happens? Well, the short answer to that, and it's, it's, it's obviously a, a simplification, but uh, <clears throat> if you've had a co-regulating other as you have evolved as a person in this world, in other words, mm -hmm. if you've had a, an attentive, emotionally attuned partner, uh, parent, mother, caretaker, in the process of going through your fears, your rages, mm -hmm. your possessive loves, um, mm -hmm. all of the extreme archetypal affects that we that we have, and the and the terror of 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 an unpredictable world. If you've had someone to help name them, mm -hmm. to contain them, to supply mythologies. Mm -hmm. Uh, to provide you with stories that make it tolerable, like um, religious stories, mythological stories that make this the hard edges of this reality that you are experiencing as a child, like this premature death of your father, that little girl in that story. If the mother can help metabolize that by telling stories, by joining the stories the little girl has about the angel, this mm -hmm. is the way the mythopoetic in the imaginal world supply us with artistic um, places to live, symbolic places to live. I mean, Jung said we live in psyche. Psyche isn't in us. We live in psyche like fish live in water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's not always easy to get to psyche when, when you have an experience like that little girl, right? <laughs> I'm working with a bunch of Ukrainian uh, therapists right now uh, they're asking me to help them supervise some of their uh, some of their uh, candidate therapists within the Jungian uh, enclave over there, uh, and of course they're all working in a war zone, so that they're doing trauma work while they're in a trauma vortex themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've discovered is that uh, what they Trauma makes everything literal and concrete, hmm. organized around survival. Hmm. What these people are appreciating about our time together is that they get to talk about clients who bring dreams, and they have their own dreams. And so suddenly, or a client brings a fairy tale um, or a story that puts something in about the traumatic uh, world that they're living in uh, into a, a narrative, into a story, a mythopoetic story. And what we discover is that when we can move from the literal tension-filled, anxiety-filled, fear-filled trauma of the, of the world into the mythopoetic, we're suddenly in a symbol system that generates hope and containment and human connection. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're all in this together and we know mm -hmm. the stories. We live the stories. And so we know the dreams and we participate in, in the dreaming process. So uh, they've been very grateful just to have a space where they can talk about the psyche instead of the literal uh, mm -hmm. mentioned and and our patients are like this too I, I had one one time a patient who used to come up to Katona my little village where I practiced for years in uh, in New York State and he used to drive the ride the train up from he was a stockbroker <laughs> and he said you know this train ride and this session is the only time in my week when I consider the inner world yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he said, "Thank God you moved out of town, so I have a train ride." Yeah. <laughs> so it's longer. Okay. I can think about my dream and think about what I want to talk about and think about what's happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, because we all live such fast-paced lives out there. Mm -hmm. Well, so and just as an aside, I think uh, now that a lot of us are seeing patients on Zoom, there isn't that you know twenty-minute yeah. ride. It's just. Uh, Click into the session. So you know that's really true. Yeah. 
We're, so there's a waiting room to sit in. You know, we go immediately from our breakfast into our session. And yeah, yeah it's a very different reality. So, Don, help us understand what the psyche of someone is like who hasn't had the benefit of that co-regulation, hasn't had the benefit of a, a containing mythology, a way that the psyche has learned to use metaphor to contain symbol systems. So in that person, mm -hmm. they're being provoked by false news or something has happened and the system is not functioning correctly. What Narrate what happens in that person, if you can. Well, in that person, um, first of all, that person is vigilantly scanning the outer world all the time. Okay, that person is not comfortable in the inner world because the threat that they have experienced has come from the outer world. So they're vigilantly scanning the outer world. And what they're scanning for is disrespect in people because they're, they're, they're very sensitively attuned to being dissed or disrespected or ignored or dropped or um, you know, denigrated by somebody or, uh, catastrophes like hurricanes. Um, you know, we live in a culture mm. where, you know, the weather channel runs 24 seven, something called storm stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, we can't get enough crises. Uh, I, I had people, uh, we had a, a minor windstorm here. Uh, the remnants of a hur hurricane Lee that hit the coast mm -hmm. of Maine. And I had several people from California call me and say, are you all right? Yeah. Because they were finding out that, you know, the, the news, the weather, the apocalyptic stories, these are trauma stories that appeal to our catastrophizing, to our apocalyptic yeah. mm -hmm. archetypal tendencies to mythologize uh, because we love mythologies. We love extreme stories. We love, um, you know, extreme sports. We love everything in the extremes because it gives us a boost. It gives us that high and we become addicted to these highs. So people with a trauma history are very scanning the environment for danger and, uh, and being dissed. That's one feature. Um, so another, in, in short, Joseph, this is a fear psychology that's promulgated in, in the literal worries, the worried mind takes a trauma survivor into all kinds of scenarios uh, of terror. And so a lot of, a lot of pa patients, you know, their worried minds takes them into all kinds of, of fearful results of this and that. And, um, mm -hmm. so a lot of our work is simply to help contextualize, help moderate, help humanize those, uh, the extremes that the worried mind uh, yeah. creates for them because the worried yeah. mind creates scenarios. You, you know, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the middle of wa warfare against two major nations, said to the American public, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Mm -hmm. Trans, you know, fast forward. Now we have dignitaries, presidents, ex-presidents, not the current president, thank God, but our notorious previous president, ginning up as much fear as possible, mm -hmm. as much outrage as possible. Uh, yeah. Immigrants are swarming over our borders. Terrorists are infecting us. You know, LGBTQ people are infecting our, you know, so, so, this is a very, very different way of proceeding. And the lack of leadership at the top, who is helping right. us not to fear what the worried mind fears all the time, is appalling to me. We, we need more fireside chats. We need leaders <laughs> in positions who have right. integrated psyches right. and who have a perspective helping us understand you know, what is the, the, the danger that Putin's going to use in nuclear warfare. Mm -hmm is the danger if we give F-16s to Ukraine? What is actually going to happen? Because what's going to happen if we get COVID, you know, or we don't get vaccinated? All these things are, are now generating a huge amount of worry and anxiety in the general public. And, and we have very few leaders who are helping.
Can I offer I'm, a quote? Uh, yes. Because it's so great and it's perfect here. We think we can congratulate ourselves on having already reached such a pinnacle of clarity, imagining that we have left all these phantasmal gods far behind. But what we have left behind are only verbal specters, not the psychic facts that were responsible for the birth of the gods. We are still as much possessed today by autonomous psychic contents as if they were Olympians. Today, they are called phobias, obsessions, and so forth. In a word, neurotic symptoms. The gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus and provides curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world, which I think is exactly what you were just talking about, Don. Yeah. It is exactly what I was talking about. And I would just add to that, the gods mm -hmm. have become defenses. Yeah, that's great. You see, because uh, one thing Jung did not talk about so much was the role of dissociative defenses and yeah. their archetypal manifestations in the psyche. And um, so that's what where my work comes in, the inner world of trauma and trauma in the soul. I'm trying to, to help us understand that uh, dissociation, uh, the, the dissociation that Jung described and discussed is mostly a conflict psychology dissociation. Mm -hmm. He talked about dissociation, splitting off the complexes, disagreeable feelings, painful feelings, uh, complexes, and so on. What he didn't talk about, well, he did actually refer to them. He talked about complexes from the collective unconscious. And he said, I don't know really what these are. But they seem to be experiences that were so devastating for the individual that it wiped out their entire life. And those are what I'm talking about are the more severe forms of dissociation that are a part of very early trauma and that give us mm -hmm. these these monsters and saviors, mm -hmm. you know, these mm -hmm. beasts mm -hmm. and saviors, which are part of the apocalyptic dimension mm -hmm. of, of archetypal defense. So, Don... Let's take the map the next step. So we have the traumatized individual who's hypervigilant and they have scanned and they believe they have found evidence of disrespect. They've been watching terrifying videos. And then the bright angel who is a defense gins up enough fantasy that they have been violated, that their innocence has been violated even now. Right. even in this moment, which creates that unholy alliance and entitles them to hatred. Right. So talk about that defense <laughs> that gins up the fantasy that my innocence has been violated. That's the next part of that formula. Yeah, innocence is a terribly important thing in the human psyche. It's a real thing. But there are two kinds of innocence. There is the generative innocence of origins, the true self, the vital spark of the divine self, what Jung called the divine child in the psyche, the carrier mm. of the human soul. That that is a genuine reality. I mean, uh, you know, the doctrine of original sin is basically a trauma psychology. The doctrine of original blessing, or the fact that we are all born as facets of the great cosmic hmm. godhead and that we are entitled to be here that we are all equal because we're sacred that is the basic doctrine of our of our declaration of independence i mean jefferson got it right he just left women out he left slaves out but he got it right humankind is equal we are all equal. We're demos. We're the people. Because we're all part of, 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 of the great human experiment. We're, we all suffer that destiny. So, Joseph, back to your, your question. Um, but there is an innocence that also can be used. Uh, and mind you, innocence is, is technically not a human category, it's an archetype. 
it's an extreme, right? I mean, none of us is truly innocent from the moment that we're born, you know, and we're pounding on our mother's breast because it's empty or whatever. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, you could say we're innocent, but the point is there's an innocence that's used by the authoritarian and defensive system to justify violence. Uh, Christopher Bolas calls that malignant innocence. Hmm. It's a very interesting fact. And you will find in the MAGA Republican base, for example, an assumption of innocence on the part of Americans are innocent. We have manifest destiny. Uh, we are exceptional. We are the shining city on the hill. We are innocent. We, we, um, liberated the world from the evil Nazis and the evil communists. Well, guess what? That innocence is a part of the archetypal inheritance, but so mm -hmm. is the propensity to do evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. you know, Jung has this, this fantastic quote. Um, I don't know whether we have time for this quote now, but um, he says, you know, the evil that has been perpetrated by the white-skinned colonials on the dark-skinned peoples of the earth is truly appalling. He said, and even though many of us were not there among the slave ships and so forth, we still, as human beings, have the propensity mm. to create, to do that evil at any time, just the fact that we weren't there at the moment and weren't mm -hmm. swept up into the melee doesn't mean that we're innocent. So Jung says, we have to have some imagination for evil. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. he means by that is we have to have some imagination about our own evil. Sure. Not the fact that we're guilty of hideous and heinous crimes yet, but that we have this openness, this propensity, and, and violence is a big part of it, um, to do evil. So link together the, in this clinical scenario, the malignant innocence inside an individual, that paradigm, and how it comes into union with this primal aggressive violence in the personality and then convinces them to unleash themselves right. upon the other. Yeah. To help us understand how that happens, because I think for many of us, the word innocence and violence, it's hard to imagine how those marry each other. Well, I'll give you an example uh, from uh, a swim I took at a Santa Fe health club. Um, <laughs> I was... Um, going to this wonderful Olympic swimming pool and swimming uh, most mornings uh, at 9 a.m. And um, then COVID hit. And instead of us being able to report and just swim, we then had to make appointments. So I made an appointment for 9 a.m. for one of three lanes, and I arrived at about five minutes to nine. And um, there was a young woman swimmer that I knew from previous swims, uh, standing outside the door. And I said, well, can we go in? And she said, well, if you want to meet the Gestapo, yes, <laughs> I'll go in with you. Uh, and I said, what? And I looked through the door and there was Barbara standing there. Barbara was a, a rather rigid, uh, obsessive, compulsive, uh, staff member. She wasn't the Gestapo. And I said, I know Barbara. That's all right. So I said, come on in. So we went in. Barbara jumps up from behind her desk, comes over to me with both hands out like this, says, no, 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 you don't belong here. Back out until nine o'clock. We'll let you know when you can come in. Mm -hmm. There are rules here, you know. Well. Now, guess what <laughs> happened inside me? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very vigorous swim that morning. Uh, <laughs> there was steam coming off the water. I was imagining conversations with Barbara that went something like, uh, you've missed your calling, Barbara. You should be a member of the police. Uh, or, or something like, you know, you would have fit right into Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, <laughs> and 
then I, I got out of the pool and by that time, some of my steam was gone and I got dressed. And as I got dressed, I said to myself, Kelshed, what are you doing? And as I tied my shoes, I realized that I'd skipped over the most important feeling that I had had in that interchange. And that was a certain sense of violation of my innocence. Yeah. And I was just simply there to swim, and I was sun- suddenly made to feel bad. I was no longer feeling good. I was feeling bad. And, and, um, I can't put that on Barbara. She didn't make me feel bad. I already had a propensity to feel bad. (laughs) I mean, how many times had had I been scolded and told to stop this or that in my upbringing? But so all that came back. So on my way out, I, um, I, I did a little democracy work. I went to Barbara and I said, listen, uh, you perhaps could sense that I was pretty peeved at the way uh, that morning started at the pool. And um, I just want to say that uh, I understand, um, you know, I get triggered in these situations. And she said, so do I. And I said, you know, and probably uh, being keeper of the rules, you've had some experiences uh, of people who've broken the rules. And she said, you have no idea. And then she poured Mm -hmm. out uh, Mm -hmm. how entitled uh, we members of this pool seem to be many of us. She says, not you, but let me tell you. And then, so we, we both commiserated and we left as friends. And after that event, I had a deeper relationship with Barbara. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had weathered a storm in which both Mm -hmm. violence and innocence were somehow allowed to work together and, and um, mm-hmm. and I came to realize I also learned something about myself how easily how easily my uh, innocence can be used uh, to justify my own violence. But, but you made a repair. I did make a repair. You, yeah. You know, and that that there is you know some kind of secret sauce that our collective needs desperately. That it's it's not. So much, I mean, in the case of you and uh, Barbara, uh, that's possible, but it's not the injury. It's we're all going to injure each other. We're going to screw up. Yeah. We're going to say things we didn't mean. We're going to yeah. uh, disappoint each other. Yeah. Uh, so it's about how can we hold it, you know, the way that you did. It's such a great. Uh, allegory or uh, example of uh, make the repair, make the repair, reach out and report out. Um, this is how I felt. Uh, and then that connection between you and Barbara is stronger because you engaged in a conflict psychology. Conflict psychology. And we held it long enough. Yes. So yeah. that, um, so that the repair happened when we could realize the human story yes. that we were each involved with. I mean, she was involved right. in a very human story of being the rule keeper, and I was involved in a in a human story of just seeking yeah. water. Uh, right. <laughs> so once we got to that, <laughs> then the repair happened automatically. Uh, each of you had been hurt. She'd yeah. been hurt by disgruntled uh customers to the pool oh yeah uh, who you know didn't treat her with respect and she had the job of enforcing the rules and you were hurt by here's the empty pool can't we come in a couple minutes early um and this you know push back of no yeah um so it comes you know the these hurts and some of them are really very big and you know the 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 effect of making one bad and that is a trauma issue because the traumatized person is always afraid that they're going to be made bad mm-hmm. um, they have had that experience of being shamed and now they're being shamed by the dark angel in the system all the time mm-hmm. so they're very vigilant about 
uh, you know, they don't feel in touch with their own innocence. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they wouldn't always be feeling so bad about themselves and, and ready to be made bad by other people. Um, I once had a, a wonderful uh, client um, who was now an analyst and she was in her 60s reporting this. And she reported a moment from her childhood that was with her to this day that made her feel bad even now. Um, she, the family had just moved to a new neighborhood. The whole family was standing on a sunny porch of the new house. Mm. Uh, the moving van was there. The neighbors had come over to greet them. And she, as a four-year-old little girl, ran down and picked a bouquet of, of uh, flowers for her mother, ran up the steps and handed them to her mother. Mm. And the mother did exactly what Barbara did with me. Uh, there was an innocent gesture of love and appreciation, right? Mother said, no, Barbara, how could you do that? You pick those flowers from Mrs. So-and-so's yard. Now you go and apologize to her. And she dragged her over, hmm. forced an apology out of her. Now that was a moment when my patient said, I understood when I think about that, what shame is. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't just that I had done something that I was guilty for and that I could atone for. It was that I was bad at the core. Yes. It was a spontaneous gesture, and that's a core gesture. That's a gesture that comes out of our innocence. And so if that's what's made bad, we'll never forget it. Don, what I'd like to do is continue in this wonderful um, formula you've given us and I recognize things are so much more complicated, but it's so helpful for us to at least imagine that there's a, a sequence of things. So there's an individual or a group. Maybe they have a trauma history, or maybe they're being traumatized by being overexposed in a kind of secondary traumatizing way. But they've been put in a hypervigilant state chronically. They're scanning for disrespect, scanning for shames, scanning for traumatic events that might happen to them, and they don't have the calming, co-regulating, mythopoetic defense against that, so they're, they're in the distress. This activates particularly a malignant innocence, the archetype of innocence, that one should be innocent, we're entitled to be innocent, something's wrong, if we're not innocent, this is still incredibly painful. The malignant innocence enters into a kind of unholy union, a term I, I so like that you used in one of your books, with the dark angel, with violence, particularly with hatred, because it gives one sense, a, a temporary feeling of identity, a temporary feeling of cohesion. Right. And then we have that figure. Now, suppose in an extreme example, this is, a, this is our wife, this is our husband, who now has, is in that full state. They're launched righteously, dangerously, and we're in the crosshairs, Perhaps it's a neighbor who's got us in the crosshairs. Perhaps it's an organization, a group, that has stirred up the same kind of sequence in the general community, in a group collective. And, and you or I or someone we love is in the crosshairs of that. What does one do? How do mm -hmm. we survive that? What's the medicine? What's possible for the person in the crosshairs of it? Well, um, I think you're talking about what if somebody that we really care for and are close to is in that state. Is that correct? Joseph, do I follow you? Y yes, and they're possessed. Y yeah, they are now temporarily. By the inner fascist, and mm, that's they're right. mm -hmm. launched now. Yeah, they're launched, and they're they're on their high horses, and they're um they're they're making us uh into someone who just doesn't understand them or they're making us into someone bad or they're making us into someone who just 
you know, has never experienced anything like this and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's... Well, so when they have to run away from, go into a fugue state, they have to divorce, they have to menace because if you're around, you're suddenly the problem. Right. You become the scapegoat. Yeah. People can do this to their own children if they're trapped. Oh, yeah. And this. patients can do it to therapists. I mean, I remember sitting with a man who was an eminent analyst who had fired his two previous analysts, and uh, we were in an interchange where he was about to fire me oh. because uh, I um, I had flared in response to one of his angry mm -hmm. statements. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And uh, he had gotten me. Uh, yeah. And, so um, there we were. I mean, he said, you have a lot of shadow work to do, Cal said. You oh, really God. do. I mean, uh, you know, and and you're like a lot of the other people I've worked with. I, You know, what's somebody like me to do if I want to work with this aggression in me? If every time I get a little angry, it stimulates the shadow in my partner and, you know, essentially the relationship is over. You know, this is useless. Uh, you should be paying me for this session. So there I was. <laughs> and there we all might wow. be, or are, or have been many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so wh what does yeah. one do? Yeah. Well, you know, what you try to do is get under the, the, um, the Italian response, the, the reactive, um, natural uh, response, uh, rational, angry in return, making your point, justifying yourself, standing up for yourself, mm -hmm. all of that. Stuff. Uh, and sometimes all you can do is take a pause, realize that you're triggered, you're complex right now, and try to get back to the human, all too human vulnerability that was, that was hit, triggered, and try to figure out, if you can, where are you right now in your history? So in that particular instance, I was able to do that. Uh, I was able to say, well, you know, there's very little I could say here that would be helpful to you, I think, except maybe to just tell you where I am emotionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so I'm feeling very threatened right now and um, mm -hmm. I'm feeling like a failure as your therapist, and I don't like that feeling. Um, and clearly, you know, you're right that what you just got from me was a triggered response. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about the emotional reality mm -hmm. behind it. And so I tried to reach back and say, you know, this puts me in a very familiar place in my life. And I don't know where you are, but that's where I am. And that's about all I think I can do right now is just share, yeah. share that human vulnerability underneath, mm -hmm. underneath yeah, but, this, yeah. tape, this ping pong match that we're in. So, and so, he burst so, into tears. Mm, right. mm. It's it's going back inside, reflecting, and putting words to feelings. Of I'm feeling triggered right now. I'm yeah. upset right now. I feel blah 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 blah. Of sharing yourself. Well, yourself, yeah, but you got to share the vulnerable side of yourself because you exactly. Remember I was having lots of feelings, but they weren't very pleasant. Exactly. Uh, and they wouldn't have been very pretty uh, uh, if I had voiced those defensive feelings. Right. I had to get underneath the defense. And and that's, you know, he he was, that session proved to be a sort of a talisman for both of us. He he said, thank you. He said, that that's what nobody else has done with me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And of course, then he tested me a half a dozen times after that also. I mean, it wasn't yeah. over. Yeah. But at so, least we got through something in that moment. It take, goes back to that co-regulation. Yeah. Of if, right. uh, if there is an other who can understand, put words to feelings mm -hmm. in a non-activated, non-defensive way, uh, it makes a huge difference. It does, right. and, and it's something that comes with old age, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I, it's in, no. if we if we do it with little kids. I mean, uh, you know, when uh, the little kid runs in with a scraped knee, we we say, "Oh my goodness, that's really it really yeah. hurts," and look, right. it's bleeding. Uh, we it doesn't cost us anything to be empathic. A part of us knows it's a scraped knee and it's not a disaster, and another part of us is very empathic about you know how upset this little boy or girl is. Mm-hmm. But it's much harder to do as we get older when we feel attacked. Well, what I was going to say, what I meant was, is that if this patient who I just described to you had seen me 20 years earlier, Mm -hmm. uh, he would have fired me, too, because I would have been defensive. Mm -hmm. Ah. Um, You know, you learn over the course of working with this material and with your own emotional life, you learn what works. Uh, when you're in the heat of those uh, those triggered constellated moments, and mm-hmm. and so I was I was lucky. Uh, he was lucky that he got me when I was in my late seventies. Mm. Mm. Don, describe for mm-hmm. us that part that must come forward. That in the onslaught, when we're receiving the fire, the projections, the the brokenness, mm-hmm. the madness the unholy union of malignant innocence and violence, when one is receiving that, there is a part of you that you called forward, that you decided to bring forward, that you call the vulnerable one, but it's the vulnerable one who also will not be destroyed by meeting the reality of the other. How do you evoke that? How do you imagine it? What is it called? How does it show up in mythology? What is Mm -hmm. that part Mm -hmm. that can withstand the relationship and call it forward in the space? Well, what you said there, I think, is really worth repeating. The vulnerable one who will not be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Um, The vulnerable one is destroyed if it isn't voiced. This is the important thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. What we do to, to give voice you know, voice to the inaudible, voice to the vulnerable parts that have never been spoken up for before. Um, when we do that, we we uh, somehow redeem the unconscious vulnerability and make it conscious. Uh, by making it conscious, uh, we do something really terribly important because um, for every child that's born in mythology, for every heroic child or redeemer child that's born in mythology, there's always the forces of the old order, the forces of the authoritarian old order that want to kill it. I mean, the classic example in our Christian tradition is King Herod and his sending his minions out to kill all mm-hmm. the children younger than two years of age when he hears that the new divine child has been born, the new creative mm-hmm. principle, the new dispensation, the child, the the spark of light born under a star in the darkest time of the year. That's that's the vulnerable, what Jesus said, the least of these. Mm -hmm. He is the least of these. The same is true in the Isis, Osiris, Horus myth. The child um, is born, and as soon as the child is born, the, the, uh, the principle of violence, Seth, uh, tries to find him and kill him and, uh, and dismembers him. Right. So, uh, this is age old. It's in all the mythologies that, that enshrine the fact that these archetypal defenses of the vulnerable parts of us are activated by new birth, by new life, uh, by expression of feeling and, so they're they're in us all the time, and um, so we have to find ways of representing those parts of ourselves. That John Bradshaw many years ago did a lot of wonderful work about this, about the lost inner child, and um, he was part of the ACA and and mm-hmm. um, you know Alcoholics Anonymous uh, work and. 
it's still relevant. Alice Miller brought this wounded child into our consciousness, D.W. Winnicott, and all the early trauma literature in the object relations field, and Jung in his child, his essay on the divine child, which is, I think, still one of the seminal pieces mm -hmm. of work that Jung ever did, talks about the child archetype and the, um, the fact that uh, the orphan child, the, the exiled child, the lost child, the banished child, and the innocent child are essential to the through the life of the psyche. So, it, if I come back to this uh, question of what would I need to access and bring forward to stand in the crosshair, stand in the fire of the one who is uh, traumatizing and traumatogenic in mm -hmm. that moment as well. So it is it sounds like you're saying that we earn access to our own capacity to suffer and not be annihilated, to suffer and yet remain one thing, to remain integrated. Right. Jung and Ion felt in the evolution of the god image from the anthropomorphic, uh, the etheriomorphic gods to the image of Christ, this evolving archetype of something inside that is able to suffer and not be destroyed. That's right. Perhaps yeah. the precursor of that might have been Prometheus, Dionysus, a bit of Osiris, but mm -hmm. the first human deity who can mm -hmm. suffer and not be destroyed, perhaps even... Suffer and Peter. not be destroyed. It's human... Uh, the humanization of the archetypes. You know, Jung talked about how if we really want to do the work of individuation, we have to slough off our mythological envelopes. Mm. That's great. <laughs> I always love that great. phrase, sloughing off our mythological envelopes. In other words, disidentify from those inflated energies that come to our rescue mm -hmm. from the archetypal world and give us ready, you know, identificatory figures, whether it's the raging bull, uh, you know, or the, um, the compassionate, sentimental uh, uh, mother of all wounded creatures. You know, I had, I had a patient once who was frequently, she would rescue all the injured animals that she found on the roads of Westchester County, north of New York, and take them to the vets. Mm. And the snakes and bunny rabbits and chipmunks and squirrels and God knows what. And, and yet she was a, a harridan with her husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, she, the, these two archetypal identifications were very divided in her. She was the bright angel with the animals who didn't object. And she was, uh, the violent angel, uh, when she got into relationship with her husband. And of course, with me, it was up to me to, um, to uh, bridge the gap, and I had a lot of trouble with that. Um, hmm. Once arrived at a session, and she said, "I can't have my session because there's an injured pigeon down on the stoop of your of your building." Uh, this was 34 floors down, and uh, I made the mistake of saying, "You're kidding! <laughs> you can't have your session because there's an injured pigeon." And then I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. So uh, I said, well, what what do we need to do to make it possible for you to have your session with this injured pigeon? She said, well, we have to get a box and some bread and go down there and get the pigeon in a box and, and leave it with the doorman. That's okay. But we can't carry on. And so I did. And and that that um, that rescued that almost failed analytic relationship from uh, from a crisis, hmm. uh, and you know, she didn't stay with me very long. But oh. at least for that session, uh, I always think about that as the pigeon session. <laughs> <laughs> but what does it take? How do what can we maybe lay out for listeners of 
uh, how do we remember or what are the steps in that kind of a process so that the next time we're, you know, really set off and we will be, Mm -hmm. we will be about stuff out there that's in the news or Mm -hmm. stuff with our next door neighbor, one of our kids, uh, a partner. What, how do we rein ourselves back in? What's the well, inner process look like? Yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, Paul Russell, a uh, Boston analyst who's deceased now, said trauma is an injury to the capacity to feel. Yes. Mm-hmm. He also said that's a discoverable capacity. Mm-hmm. But it takes a lot of work. And it takes work because the tension between the opposite feelings, the archetypal affects of possessive, all-consuming love on the one hand and annihilating hate on the other are, are always the sort of bookends between which we have to negotiate our human life, right? And we're going to, we're going to hate our spouses. We're going to love our spouses. And in between, we have to become sensitive to the vulnerable core of the evolving self, that vulnerable core of the, of the inner child self, the humble human self that's always, uh, going to be hurting others or going to be identified with others hurt and that we need to hold all of that together and to find a language become emotionally literate enough Mm -hmm. to speak for all those parts Mm. the loving the hating and the and the struggling person inside who's trying to evolve uh, a deeper form of relatedness and and a deeper connection in intimacy with other people it's which if i if i may i I mean what you just said calls to mind uh, cartman's drama triangle which I think is what happens when we engage in splitting. We get Ooh. identified with either the victim or usually the rescue, either the victim or the rescuer, and yes. someone else gets projected, our, our perpetrator gets projected out on someone else, and that's, that's the drama triangle. And you can you know, examine your own life. Is there any way where you are one of the people in that, in that triangle, either the... Yes persecutor the uh rescuer or the victim and usually we're, we we we're consciously identified with either the victim or the rescuer and uh what you're saying don is the task is to be able to to recognize that we are all of those things and we are all to things. project all of life right i mean yeah. we're um and and you know, mm-hmm. victims, uh, that's part of that malignant innocence oftentimes mm-hmm. because it turns, turns their genuine pain and suffering and hurt into a cause celeb in a story, right? Yes. That and again, this is happening like, all over the place in the culture. You can find that drama triangle at a cultural level in many places. That's a great example. Who is, whose drama tri- triangle is that? It's um, Karpman. I think it's K A R P M A N. I think it was a. Um, what yeah. is that, Joseph? Is that transactional analysis, maybe? I'm not sure, but it's uh, mm-hmm. something that's used um, to great effect in organizations, mm-hmm. uh, in corporate coaching. Yeah, well, you see, um, they're, really they're helpful. angels and the inner child right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's the democracy. Right. Democracy is in the middle of, tr- of struggling yeah. with all of those parts. Right. Right. Uh, all of the parts represented at the same table, you know, e exactly. pluribus unum, out of those <laughs> That's many. Great. One. That's great. That's that that is yes. such a psychological statement, isn't it? E pluribus yeah. unum. I love that. Yeah. That's great. So, so I'm left with uh, just a final thought, Don. Um, mm-hmm. So there are times that we may be carrying a kind of inhuman force and delivering it out mm-hmm. against a person or in one direction or the other. And there's a process for us to try to pause and reflect and return to our own humanity. There are times when we are in the crosshairs of inhuman forces. Someone else, an organization is possessed. Yeah. So if we find ourselves in the crosshairs of what is inhuman,
that it is up to us to to fully articulate and confess the way that we are affected by what is happening. That's right. Yes. That's absolutely right. It's, it's a matter of observation, witnessing, and knowing when we get taken up by one of those archetypal powers. Like, for example, when I was taken up by my rage <laughs> um, in the swim, mm -hmm. I couldn't get to what was happening until I stopped the swim, had a moment to reflect, you know, while I was vulnerable out of the shower getting dressed. And mm -hmm. then I suddenly realized, and I don't think I would have if I hadn't been doing this work for many years and realizing when complexes get triggered. But yes. So and the, uh, yes, for the inhuman to become human. That's right. It mm -hmm. brings us full circle to the Simone vile okay, yes. quote the false god turns suffering into violence turns the human into the inhuman That's right and the true god the self turns violence back into suffering yeah that's what democracy that is, does yes see, democracy turns the extremes into human compost right mm. <laughs> it, it, it's mm. a it's it, it's a constantly taking projections Mm -hmm. And human, it's, it's yes. like you yes. come out of a, you know, you come out of an election and you've been fighting, you know, as Jung said in Switzerland, we've succeeded in introverting war. He said, we hate each other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fight each other <laughs> within the limits of the law and the election. And then we come out of it and something new has happened. Like any of you who were present, say at Mandela's inaugural address in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. or Obama's acceptance speech at, in Grant Park at the end of the, the 2008 mm -hmm. eight election. These are transcendent moments where you've struggled with the opposites and something new has happened. And it doesn't last long. <laughs> but it's about freedom. It's what democracy offers us. It's a transcendent moment. You know, it, it's a moment when the spirit soars. The spirit mm. in authoritarianism doesn't soar, it marches. Mm. 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 So this is the difference. We get to something through the agony and ecstasy of a democratic process that is truly special. And, um, you know, there have been various in, enlightened people who have known this over the years. Um, and thank God for them. It's uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right now. You know, democracy is 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 on the ropes. Inner I, and I still outer. am optimistic about the future, but I I'm worried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Inner and outer, just uh, yeah. as you said in your paper, and Lisa, you just said, and we mm -hmm. we can all start with the inner. That's yep. available to us practically on a daily basis. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe I'll just invoke in, in parting, you know, someone, Barbara Hanna reports that uh, someone asked Jung in the 1950s, um, you know, w will humanity survive, you know, uh, the uh, uh, a nuclear war, or is that where we're headed? And um, Jung said, I think it depends on how many people are willing to do the inner work. The inner so, work, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the relational work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know it's it, that's the one part of Jung psychology that he tended because he was so introverted to neglect. It's inner work, it's active imagination, it's all of the inner things we do, but it's also relational. We we get to democracy through relating. It's about demos. It's about of by and for the people. Mm -hmm. Relation. Mm -hmm. Well, Don, this has been so, so rich and really profound, I think, and I hope incredibly useful to, I know it's been useful to me. I hope it's, I believe it will be incredibly useful to our listeners as well. Well, it's been fun and thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's a rare opportunity for me to get to uh, sort of spout off these ideas, which are so important to me in a forum in which they're understood and, and, and really respected and honored. So I appreciate very much. 
Come We're back so and shout anytime, yes. Don. Yeah. Please come back. <laughs> okay. As long as okay. I get. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.